My name is Andrew Kenny and welcome to my series of reflections on the gospel songs of Bob Dylan. As Leonard Cohen said about these songs, I thought those were some of the most beautiful gospel songs that have ever entered the whole landscape of gospel music. I would have to agree with Leonard that they are truly a magnificent collection of gospel songs sung with passion and brilliance. I'm going to look at that wonderful track, Precious Angel, from the Slow Train album. It has been described as a religious love song. When it first came out, I always thought it was comparable to George Harrison's My Sweet Lord. During a concert in Seattle on January of 1980, Bob claimed that the song was addressed to the woman who led him to Christ. In Bob's words, she was the one who was appointed to show me I was blinded, to show me I was gone, how weak was the foundation I was standing upon. Precious angel, under the sun, how was I to know you'd be the one to show me I was blinded, to show me I was gone, how weak was the foundation I was standing upon. Neither spiritual warfare, flesh and blood breaking down, you either got faith or you got unbelief and there ain't no neutral ground. The enemy is subtle, albeit we are so deceived when the truth's in our hearts and we still don't believe. Precious angel under the sun. Under the sun implies that the angel is not a heavenly angel, but a human one. An angel is also described as being an attendant, an agent or messenger of God. Though regarded as spiritual beings, God can often use humans to be his servants and messengers So I suppose in that regard they can be regarded as angels, and if they are particularly spiritual and helpful, much more so. How was I to know you'd be the one? To show me I was blinded? To show me I was gone? How weak was the foundation I was standing upon? Paul in the Bible writes that before we become Christians we are blinded. He writes, in their case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers. To keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the likeness of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, Let the light shine out of the darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In other words, before a person comes to Christ, they are blinded to spiritual realities. Their spiritual eyes need to be opened. In the great song, Amazing Grace, we see the same truth. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. In my own experience, it was like the scales came off my eyes. One moment I had lots of doubts and fears. Then I knew for certain in my heart that I had been changed not by some extreme effort on my part to try and believe, but by the grace of God. I knew it was real and that he cared for me. The light was turned on and the truth finally dawned on me. As Paul stated, the Son of God loved me and gave himself for me. Yet this was the same man who was putting Christians in prison and trying to get them to blaspheme Christ. The chorus is wonderful as well and could be addressed to the precious angel or the Lord himself. Whichever it is, this light ultimately comes from the Lord. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, is the light given by God. He bids each of us to shine in this world of darkness, even if it is only in our small corner. It goes, shine your light, shine your light on me. Shine your light, shine your light on me. Shine your light, shine your light on me. You know, I just couldn't make it by myself. I'm a little too blind to see. Christ also said of himself, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And he called his followers the light of the world and told them to let their light shine and not to hide it. In the book of Psalms, it also states, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
So we have a choice, light or darkness. Bob continues, my so-called friends have fallen under a spell. They look me squarely in the eye and they say, all is well. Can they imagine the darkness that will fall from on high when men will beg God to kill them and they won't be able to die? This is a particularly poignant verse when strong words are spoken. Many don't like the judgmental words. He is talking about his friends who seem to be spiritually blind and who can't see the danger that they're in. Should he use smooth words and agree with them that all is well? He could do that for show, but he would not be honest to himself or them. If we are unwell with a serious illness such as cancer, but unaware of what is wrong with us, if we went to the doctor, what would we want him to tell us? Would we want him to tell us that there is nothing to worry about? Or would we want him to tell us the truth that we will soon die and must take action including setting our affairs in order? The verse is warning us to get right with God while we still can. Sister, let me tell you about a vision that I saw. You were drawing water for your husband. You were suffering under the law. You were telling him about Buddha. You were telling him about Muhammad in the same breath. You never mentioned one time the man who came and died a criminal's death. Here he mentions other religious leaders, Buddha and Muhammad, as well as Christ who died on the cross as a criminal, when in fact he was literally dying for the crimes of all of us, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Shine your light. Shine your light on me. Shine your light. Shine your light on me. Shine your light. Shine your light on me. You know, I just couldn't make it by myself. I'm a little too blind to see. Precious angel, you believe me when I say what God has given to us, no man can take away. We are covered in blood, girl. You know, our forefathers were slaves. Let us hope they've found mercy in their bone filled graves. When he says, what God has given to us, no man can take away. A man may take away our life, but he cannot destroy our soul. Likewise, nothing can separate us from the love of God. In fact, according to Romans 8, we need not be faithful of anything. Literally, as William Wallace in the film Braveheart said, they may take our lives, but they can never take our freedom. And Christ has given us freedom. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Not only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. The last verse I imagine is the love between a Christian man and his wife. Not unlike Bob's other classic love song, Covenant Woman. In it there is the encouragement to resist the enticement or allurement of the temptations of the flesh as the Christian finishes his earthly pilgrimage. Just today I read the passage in Luke. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? But if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began the build and wasn't able to finish. Now this is more important. We must count the cost and aim to finish well. It is no good starting well and finishing badly or not at all. As the lyrics state, the enemy is subtle, how be it? We are so deceived. We can be deceived even near the end of the race. In the game of snakes and ladders, there is always a long snake near the last square that can take you right down to the bottom. So close and yet so far. I remember when I was in the 800 meters race and my best friend overtook me on the first lap. It was a two lap race. I felt good so I sprinted as hard as I could ahead of him. But I could not sustain the pace. I thought I was going to die of exhaustion and I embarrassingly had to drop out as my body was well and truly spent. I had not the energy to keep going. An hour later I was in a 1500 meters race 
a race almost twice the distance of the first. I'd learned my lesson. I wanted to make sure I finished and didn't embarrass myself again. So I kept a steady pace and was able to finish the race. If we are running a Christian race, let us seem to be like Paul, the one-time persecutor of Christians who had been converted to Christ. Then in his 60s, he was awaiting execution at the hands of Nero, the Roman emperor of the time. His crime was being a Christian and preaching the message of God's love and hope to all mankind. He wrote this to his young prodigy, Timothy. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. The last verse. You're the queen of my flesh, girl. You're my woman, you're my delight, you're the lamp of my soul, girl. And you torch up the night. But there's violence in the eyes, girl. So let us not be enticed on the way out of Egypt through Ethiopia to the judgment hall of Christ. Shine your light. Shine your light on me. Shine your light. Shine your light on me. Shine your light. Shine your light on me. You know, I just couldn't make it by myself. I'm a little too blind to see. Thanks for joining me today. Hopefully you can join with me again. And may God bless you until next time. If you have any questions, please email me or make a comment at the end. God bless you. Bye-bye.